Up next, uh, by the way, I came out here from University of Missouri, so... Yeah. Look, the thing is, is that my, your talk is so good that I was still willing to introduce you, okay? So... You broke up with us. <laughs> no, uh, so one of these two may have superhuman analytical and infrastructure capabilities that they will tell you about today. The other one, we're still trying to figure out what their real identity is because they have a very convincing doppelganger here in the Kansas City InfoSec scene. Um, but here to talk to you about phishing your users, we've got Julie and Shane. Chief Information Security Officer at the University of Kansas. Uh, my name is Shane Fani. I'm an Information Security Systems Engineer at the University of Kansas Medical Center. And if you may have noticed by my bling here, I'm hiring. So if you, especially if you are a newbie looking to get into InfoSec for the first time, we should, yeah, you should have what she has. She's got her own printer, yo. <laughs> I do. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about fishing your users for free as in beer. Um, but, but I think the outlay of cash on this was, the first time we did it, was about five bucks. So, um, uh, the, 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 how many of you currently fish your users right now? So, not everybody, but close. Uh, all right, so um, I, I'm hoping that I can give you some ideas for how to keep doing it or how to improve your practice. For those of you who aren't yet, um, this, this talk is really aimed at helping you set up a self-fishing program on a budget but maybe even more importantly, how to set it up so that your users don't burn your house down and you don't wind up fired. Um, we may also uh, be able to help keep you off the radar of local law enforcement. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, this sucked. Um, this happened in the summer of 2016. I'm driving to work and I get a call from payroll. And they said, we've got three or four calls this morning with people who said they didn't get paid on Friday. And they swear up and down they didn't change your direct deposit information. And I'm like, well, crap, this is bad. Um, in the spirit of never letting a good crisis go to waste, uh, I requested permission to start up a self-fishing program. A little bit more about this incident. Uh, the attacker is actually targeted because we are a university, because the information that we have is generally meant to be shared, they targeted a list of distinguished professors. We want to brag about all our distinguished professors with their endowed chairs and their interest in research and their longevity at the university, right? So we, have, we publish a list of them, which the attackers are correct in assuming that these are probably some of the better paid faculty in the university. So they're like, well, I'm going to fish these guys. Maybe I get some of their paychecks. And they fished well, about 250 people. Uh, they got about seven sets of creds, and they wound up with about five paychecks out of the deal. So that, that was a drag. Um, they were also uh, pretty crafty. They, uh, but before they uh, actually made any changes to direct deposit information, you know what they did? They logged into Outlook Web Access and set rules that would delete any message we might have sent them alerting them to the direct deposit change. So, so uh, this was, this was a, a gnarly incident. Um, and because it was the summer and the vast majority of these people were off campus, overseas, doing research, we didn't have any visibility into who clicked the link. Um, we didn't know if they were off campus, we didn't have any ability to tell at the time if they clicked the link. So, um, as you can imagine, distinguished professors like having their password reset with no warning whatsoever. We were literally ch chasing people through airports in the Australian outback trying to get a hold of them so we could have, change their passwords. Anyway, this was terrible. I used it as an opportunity to start up a self-fishing uh, self program. Our motivations were not to turn this into a gotcha exercise. Uh, this is meant to be an educational opportunity, and, and not like a dope slap educational opportunity. Like we really legitimately want to train users what to do when they encounter a phishing message, because believe it or not, there are still plenty of people out there who are not credulous enough to look at a message and go, mm, this might be an issue. Um, in addition, at a university, as you might imagine, we have a lot of people who speak English as a second language, who are coming from cultures where deference to authority is really important, and they are going to look at these messages and go, well, this person says they're from KU and they're telling me to do something. If I don't do it, I'll get in trouble. Click. So we want to train them how to recognize these messages and kind of give them, uh, give them information about what to do when they get one, where to report it, and how to get training so they can learn more. 
We had a few goals, too. Um, we felt like at the time not enough people knew where to go when they needed help with this. So uh, we wanted to increase our overall visibility as an office. How do, we, how do people get a hold of us when they need to, when they have a question? Um, we wanted to increase Katie's overall security posture. We, we want fewer people clicking on stuff. Um, we also want to give them, give users reminders and practice on spotting these types of messages. What are the features they should be looking for? What are the things they need to check before they click a link? What kinds of emails should they expect to get from, from departments like HR or departments like IT? And we just wanted to drive more people to the annual required training that we do every year. So, why you should fish your users. That mandatory training you do every year, assuming you're doing it, all it's doing is providing metrics, right? All, it, all you know is ones or zeros. Yes, they took it. No, they didn't. Um, it's, it's usually annual. It's once a year. And if you show me a user who willingly takes that kind of stuff more than once a year, and I've got a rich work let me tell you. They, they just don't do it. Plus, it's kind of boring. Like, who cares? You're staring at, at, at a stack of PowerPoint slides, and then you take a quiz, and who gives a crap? Like, they, they, they're not going to remember this. Um, they're, they're also not going to develop any muscle memory for what to do when they encounter a problem. And that's what this training is meant, that's what this phishing assessment is meant to do for them. I got a fish, I forwarded here, I delete it. I don't click the link. That's what we want to do for them. So, you need permission before you do this. A, a wise man once told me that you can do anything you want on your last day. And if you go out and do this without getting permission from the appropriate folks at your company, I know who it is, <laughs> uh, you are going to, best case, burn every bit of political capital you've ever built up, and we learned how to do that from Brittany. If you do this without permission, you will torch every bit of political capital you've ever, you've ever uh, built. Worst case is you're on the set KC Slack uh, trolling the job postings channel and hoping nobody knows about that stupid, stupid thing you did. That permission needs to be written. It needs to be in the form of an email. It needs to be from your C-suite executives or your general counsel or HR or maybe all three, but you need to have permission in writing that you've been told, yes, go forth and fish your users. You also need to be keeping people in the loop. Um, Presumably, you're going to be impersonating people from your company or from your organization when you do this. So you're, if you impersonate, say, your HR department without telling them first, guess what? You're going to blow up your HR's front desk, your, their admin staff, and you're also going to burn up goodwill that you had with HR, which is probably not a department you want to burn up goodwill with. Um, so, so this is not, these, these aren't meant to be a, a double-blind study, right? You're not, you're not going to mess up the validity of your results if you give certain people at your company a heads up that these are coming. It's, so you're going to want to warn the department that you're spoofing. You're also going to want to warn your help desk. You may want even want to warn your, um, if, you're, if your organization's big enough to have its own police force, you should probably call them first. A little bit more on that in a bit. Um, and you need to be aware that, that, that you're going you're gonna to piss some people off. And you need to have the, the places that people call when they're pissed off prepped for, for this exercise. So this is not your chance to exact revenge. Um, if you're going into this thinking, yes, I can finally get my revenge on all those jerks who wouldn't let me sit at the lunch table with them when we were in middle school, you're coming at this with the wrong attitude. You're, you're conducting an education campaign. This is not uh, something that you're, you're trying to, again, do that double blind study. You want to train people what to do when they encounter the situation you're presenting them with. So you're going to give them a heads up. You're going to tell them, we're going to fish you this week. Here's how to spot a fish. Here's what to do once you've spotted it. The people who fall for your message, they are victims. They're not offenders, which I've seen them called in certain papers. They're not idiots. They're not losers. They are your victims, and you need to treat them as such. Um, the words that you use to describe your colleagues, and these people are your colleagues, are important. And when they find out, not if, when they find out that you speak for, with them with contempt, they're going to be a lot less likely to work with you and be willing to, to be your front line of defense. 
people are not your weakness link. Stop saying this. Um, you can go on Twitter right now and find some hashtag thought leader telling everybody that people are the weakest link in security. People are your front line of defense. They are not your weakest link. And reframing that is a key part of how to get your users to report things to you and be a, everybody do a shot, threat intel feed into your department to tell you what they're seeing. Because there's a good chance that you're not going to be seeing it all as quick as they do. You need to give them a way to report this stuff to you. And, and letting doing these exercises gives them a chance to practice. So they need to have an email address that they can get to you at. They need to know how to reach you by phone. Um, uh, ideally, you're giving them a, a one press button that says, here's how to report a fish, click it. Um, that, that's, that's one of the things that we're hoping to do. Uh, because right now we get, we get a lot of really innovative ways that people forward messages to us. So as you start to build your campaign, know that there's no new ground that you need to be breaking. Um, get access to your, your abuse account or your um, mail flow, your hygiene systems to get samples. Um, none of the phishing campaigns that we've done at KU have come from anywhere but our actual abuse account because it's just a wealth of information and it's a wealth of fishes that people are seeing in the real world. Um, you also, as you do this though, you, and this is something that I'm going to tell that tripped us up, you need to understand the political environment at your organization so that you can de design campaigns that are effective but not effective. Um, you, you have to know your organization's hot button topics, and I'm going to talk about one of those here on this next slide. Um, it turns out parking tickets are a really big deal at KU, and, and we understood going into this, this campaign that, that parking is a, is a hot button issue, but I don't think we fully appreciated how hot button of an issue it is. Um, we, we, did, we thought we did everything right. We called up the parking department. And I said, hey, we want to spoof you guys in a fish. Is that okay? And they were like, knock yourselves out. Okay. So we did. We, we notified them. We uh, notified our help desk. Shane built the phishing message, and we were off to the races. Um, our usual click-through rate on these campaigns, by the way, is about 7%. This parking, 7, 7, 7%. <laughs> yeah. So uh, people at KU don't read their email, it turns out. <laughs> um, uh, the click-through rate on this parking fish was 27%. People were shitting bricks about this campaign. Um, among the things that we got accused of, we caused at least three panic attacks that morning. Um, we've had people calling and were actually driving to the Douglas County Courthouse, or is in Douglas County. Uh, they were calling the Lawrence Police Department. They were calling the KU Public Safety Office, which is our police department. Um, K, at, 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 at KU, uh, screaming at parking attendants is like a club sport, so people were doing that. And um, we, we blew up local Twitter on local Twitter and learned a really valuable lesson about hot button topics. So uh, here's another one. I am not this stupid. About once a month, I have somebody that says, oh, you should totally do a fishing campaign around basketball tickets. No, no. And clearly, I need to update my graphic, because we're like 14 now. But um, you need to know what these topics are at your company. So it might not be basketball tickets. It might not be parking. It, it, it's going to be something else. Every company has the thing that everybody gets riled up about and is a really emotional BFD issue. It might be dress code, it might be benefits, it might be who knows what. But I know that at KU, basketball is a BFD. I'm never going to touch this for a couple of reasons. One, if I promise free basketball tickets and then don't deliver, somebody's going to be, somebody's going to torch my house. Two, this is going to really screw up my numbers. Like, I don't want everybody to click on my phishing campaigns. I want this, the, the people who are most likely to fall for this kind of thing to self-identify. This is going to catch up way too many people who might not otherwise click. And to be honest, most of the fishes we get are the boring, your quota is over, or your mailbox quota is over, or you, you, know, you uh, have spam messages to unlock, that kind of stuff. I'm, I, we are still in the low-hanging fruit phase. I'm not ready to start targeting the really savvy users among our population. We're just not there yet. 
Uh, so this time of year, and I felt obligated to include this because of the time of year it is, and also just because I know this crowd and I know how we think. Um, you're going to be tempted to you're going to be tempted to to spoof IRS messages or messages from other federal agencies because you know it will get a reaction, especially in April. Don't do it. The IRS actually specifically requests that people like us don't spoof people like them because your users will report those messages to the IRS. And it wastes resources. It, it, they wind up tracking down these messages that were never actually real fish to begin with. And depending on how well crafted your message is, you may be breaking the law by using their names or by using their logos. So just stay away from federal agencies when you're building these messages. Um, there's, there's just too, much, too many other easy topics to fish people about for you to, to, to pretend to be a federal, federal agency. Um, finally, look to the Nigerian scammers. There's, there are a couple of really good uh, papers and articles that I reference in the notes at the end about why Nigerian scammers build the messages that they build and how they build them. Um, they intentionally make those crappy. How many of you know that they intentionally make their messages crappy? So, great. The re for the rest of you, if Nigerian scammers made their messages really, really good, they would get way too many people responding to them. They don't know who their targets are, so they need their most gullible tar targets to self-identify. So they figure if they can get you to respond to this super crappy message that is full of bad grammar, weird spelling, poor English syntax, there's a really good chance that they're going to be able to get you over that finish line and get you to send them money. So, unless you are targeting a group of users who is really savvy, who is not going to fall for a standard phishing message, or unless you have some kind of obligation to fish your users harder than general population, I would suggest that you keep the bar of entry low, especially at the beginning because you want to identify those people who need the most follow-up and who need the most help. So, what to collect? Um, the tool we use, GoFish, is capable of collecting usernames and passwords. We could add other forms, we could add other forms into it if we wanted to, but we decided that for our own safety that we were only going to collect usernames. Um, we think this is valid for, for the, the main reason that if we can get a user to click a link put in their real username, they probably went in and, and put in their, their real password too. If we got them that far, we probably got them all the way. Um, we didn't want to collect that, those, that credential pair for a couple of reasons. One, that is like the nuclear waste of data they have sitting around, our clear text credential pairs. Two, if, if we did collect that credential pair, that credential pair is now considered compromised and because we fish about 14,000 people at a pop, we didn't feel like it was very fair to help us to then immediately dump six or seven hundred people into the password reset process all at once. I still have to work with them, so you know we decided to preserve that relationship. So, should it be world accessible? For us, yes. Our users are scattered all over Kingdom Come at all times, especially depending on the time of year. If we do these in the summer, we have way more people overseas than not. So. We make our exercises world accessible. But if you choose to do that, be aware Google will see this. And they will eventually flag your exercise as malicious. Uh, that's why we recommend the, the cheap domains that, that Shane's going to talk about in a minute, because you should anticipate that you will burn a domain or two per campaign. How long? Um, we started out thinking, yeah, we're going to run this for a week. We're going to send this message out. We're going to leave that page up for a week, and then we're going to shut it down. Well, so we kick off the exercise between 7.38 in the morning on a Monday, and by Wednesday, we noticed Chrome was starting to flag our site as malicious, and by Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning, our domain registrar had revoked her domain, and we were completely dead in the water. <laughs> so, uh, it turns out where if you do this where people can see, they will do something about it. So. Based on some research of our own, uh, you know, watching the click-through rates and then going out looking at things like the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, we realized five days is way too long. Been one business day, tops. Release the hounds at 7.30 or 8 in the morning, shut it down at about 4.30, start pulling messages out of, out of inboxes at 5. Most of our users, uh, again, paid people apparently don't check their email, uh, the, 
the data breach, the Verizon report said that people will click within the first like 90 seconds to two minutes. Our top click-throughs happen in the first two hours. So I don't know why they're so slow, but they are. So we just said, you know what, business day is plenty. We'll cut it off after one day. And the upshot of that is we haven't had to burn a domain since we shortened the period to one day. So I'm going to leave it, give it to Shane for a technical overview. Yeah, so uh, my domain registrar doesn't like me. Um, I haven't talked to him a couple times. I asked him to tell him I'm not a, a leak hack, so I'm not trying to steal this stuff. Um, but we'll go over a technical overview of uh, what we did, how we set it up, um, and a little, a little bit into the, the system we used. So Julie came up to me one day, I was like, yeah, I think we need to run an enterprise raid phishing campaign across all of campus. And I was like, cool, how much money do we have? She's like, none. <laughs> so she dug in her purse and found like 84 cents in a piece of gum, and then I had to figure it out. So the prereqs, um, you don't need a whole lot. Uh, a machine, whatever's lying around, uh, a little money, because you really nothing in life is free. And then a willingness to fear despair and hopelessness. Um, you know, most companies that perform these stress assessments and charge by head, um, but with only a few dollar hairs, you can uh, get that nice feeling of disappointment in your life. Um, now, when we ran it, we were expecting way higher numbers. Um, so, and I have some of the numbers for you, just good stuff that you can take back to your leadership and like, here, this is why we need to do it, because if uh, KU can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> he doesn't work for me anymore. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> I can say that now. Um, so, what do you need to buy? Uh, nothing, if you have the infrastructure already. Um, money is only required for special features. Um, if you want a domain, you can use registrars like Namecheap. Um, don't tell them I sent you. Uh, they have stuff at 88 cents. Uh, you can get awesome stuff like .win, .men, and .science. Um, I own a couple, just because. Um, an external email center. Uh, if you do not want to burden your own in email infrastructure, um, our email administrator was weir a little weary about it at first, um, and then I did it anyway, and it was fine. So uh, he was also expecting that uh, we would block most, he would eat most of those emails, but email hygiene doesn't work. So that's why you do this. So and the other thing you can do is just make some intern run it, and then you know that's priceless. So a system overview: uh, an underpowered VM is required if you want to do this right. <laughs> Uh, it was uh, one, it, it started off Ubuntu 14.04, 64-bit desktop, uh, one gig of RAM, one CPU core, and then a hard drive. Um, it ran just fine the first time, but uh, it, it felt sad, so I gave it some more cores and some more RAM later on. So it, it has two cores and and two gigs, and we haven't had an issue, even though we've had some people try to do fun stuff like run burp against it. Um, it handled just fine. This person was the spouse of a staff member who decided to log in from their work IP and then jump into a VPN, yeah, but they didn't realize that I was tracking them the entire time. This was the parking fish, by the way. Yeah, this was People the parking People were really upset about this. People were really upset. Um, so, you know, this is just an example of the shenanigans that you're going to see because, you know, users think that they're smarter than you, and some of them are. Um, for an example, uh, last time we did this, uh, the first set of credentials that were submitted was the username of penis. So uh, I looked, there was no one in the directory that had that username. Because <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't want to be rude and make maybe that guy's name is penis. I feel bad. <laughs> but it's not. Um, so, and then we've also had things like, you're an idiot, nice try, F you, this is BS. And then one time someone tried to log in as Julie. So. The URLs are pretty user though, so. We, 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 it was it was some grand student. Yeah, she, she told you because she clicked the <laughs> <laughs> She pulled it out of their mailbox. <laughs> so uh, the system architecture, uh, GoFish, the open source product. I encourage you all to check it out. If this is what you want to do, it's free, right? Because um, if you do it right, you should never pay more than a couple dollars a campaign. Um, I use a free Sangrid account. Don't tell them either. And then Namecheap. Uh, for registration and DNS, because I, I wanted to keep it as, um, as as legitimate as possible. I don't want people to look into it too much, right? A savvy, savvy user could figure out that that domain uh, had a DNS record for the KU IP address, but no one really did that. Um, well, a couple people did, but they kept it for themselves. So, 
you know, keep it cheap um, and keep it easy. So I'm going to go over a little bit of GoFish and then some statistics. So uh, this is the dashboard. Um, this is the old one. Uh, it looks similar, but there are a lot more features now. And I had done a whole bunch of custom stuff, but now that's unnecessary, so I just wasted my time because now it's all part of the main builds. It's in GitHub. So. Um, You'll see you get a plain overview. It's a single pane of glass, so there's your marketing buzzword. Shop. So some of the stuff that GoFish collects, um, and some of the stuff that we collect as well. Um, so GoFish collects the number of clicks, number of submissions, number of open emails. Why would you need that? Well, it's a good way to see kind of how far your your saturation was, right? Because you got to have people that click. You're gonna have people open the email that don't load that tracking. Picture. It's just a one by one tracking pixel that it keeps track of. Um, you get the IP address, the user agent string, um, and then some things we find um, we get the department and job title of every person. Uh, and then we find the off campus versus on campus rates. And then I normalize all the data so I get a better idea of the different size of departments and job titles because um, that helps us. So, some of the statistics, um, and this is the average of the last four for a year. 60% of clicked emails happened off campus, so that's off the network. 55% um, submitted credentials off the network. 65 open the emails off the network. And then 56% of people who click the link will go and submit creds. So I'll explain a little bit how you keep track of that too, but if they click the link and then, and then they get there, there's a 56% chance they're gonna go ahead and just put their creds in anyway. So, the, the phishing page wasn't enough. Um, because we consider a failure when you submit credentials. Um, now, clicking a link is dangerous. Of course, we all know that. However, in the spirit of the game, if you, if you go to the page and it looks crappy and you don't go any further, then we'll give you a pass. But, you know, you gotta keep track of that too. Um, so the most common operating system uh, was Windows, but the most common browser was Safari. That's scary. Um, so the average click rate was less than 10%, you at least at 7, it's about, about average if you subtract the whole uh, parking thing. Um, so, yeah, because the KU fish had a failure rate of 27%. So, our process, um, several steps. Uh, your first thing you want to do is you want to create your templates. Um, as Julie said, you're going to want just generic, or the running, ordinary run of the mill. Pull your stuff out of your abuse box. And don't don't be too clever um, because you know don't assume things. Make an ass out of yourself. Um, you know uh, you, you'll see here that this is what was sent, um, and I'm not creative or clever, so I just pulled this right out of the abuse box. Someone had sent it and they got it. It's really great. Um, you know, three convenient ways to pay. There's two listed, and they're both labeled one. Uh, at the top, you get a parking fine. Very excited about it. <laughs> um, so the URL and the link leads to kuparkingfine.win. Um, it's a good one because that's uh, you know knowing our parking department, they would do something like this anyway. But <laughs> we, we so, love our parking park. So so some people did notice the uh, that top line there, and uh, I got this. Uh, someone sent this to me. Um, a little help from Oprah. So, uh, you know, that's what happens when you're going to fish your IT staff, some of them are going to get clever. So this is the landing page for a different fish, an HR pay one, because we felt like this one was necessary to do since we had people that was money. So here's the HR pay page. Now, to the naked eye, it's a beautiful scrape of, oops. What did you do? I hit a button. We're, we're IT professionals. I'm not. Help desk. <laughs> So, there you go. Now, this is a look at a normal web page. This is if you go to our HR page, can't use HR page, it looks like this. Um, there are some special things I did to it, though, to uh, hopefully help users steer clear of it. Um, like, for instance, all these links up top that lead to the Google search for efficient email. <laughs> yeah. And then these two email addresses link to the abuse page. So no one noticed it, no one told me about it, so all that work was for nothing. But I gave people a chance. They all still clicked. 
Um, after you submit creds, or if you sit on the page too long, because I put an HTML tag, that after 45 seconds, because I learned that once you click the link, most users will submit creds within 45 seconds or leave. Um, so, some math there, math is fun. So about 45 seconds, if they sit too long, I go ahead and redirect them here anyway, because I don't know what they're doing and it scares me. So they get here and they can read about it, um, what they did wrong, and that it was bad. Um, so first you gotta create your groups. Uh, we do groups by um, status at the university. So staff, faculty, GTAs, URAs, all, all the works and everything, they're all special. So I've learned that with GoFish, it's a little, especially when you're running on another power VM as required, that having the groups bigger than 3,000 people kind of struggles a little slow to pull up the records. So I suggest less than 1,000. So for 14,000 groups, we have about 12, so, because some groups are big. Um, here's where you go to create a new group. It takes CSV. I, I don't use any of that. I, there's an API in Python that makes it way easier, so I have I have a PowerShell script that will generate the users based on groups, and then it'll also post it. Um, this just has a regular REST API as well. So that's how I do it, it's way easier. Um, and you're gonna wanna schedule your campaigns, I say five minutes per group, um, so it's usually enough. So the standard operating procedure, um, you wanna notify the appropriate people, as Julie said, but you're also gonna wanna tell some other people specifically what the message is gonna look like. Your email administrators are probably gonna be number one because it's really embarrassing when your phishing emails get eaten by email hygiene and you look like a noob. So tell them, give them at least the subject, sender, maybe the URL on the message so it doesn't get eaten. Uh, if you have a knock or a sock, they might want to know. Um, your IT help desk, and if you have an MSSP, maybe they should know too. Um, uh, that, that's the specific message so they know not to tell users that they need to change their passwords because that's, that's upsetting. So then after you have all that stuff, you're gonna release the hounds. So we send quarterly 14,000 emails, um, and that includes everyone on campus that's, that gets paid by KU. Uh, regular students aren't included because that'd be a mess. Um, and since we are sending, we send to an external SMTP and it comes in, uh, ex the email system we have doesn't it can handle it just fine, so I wouldn't worry about it too much because email systems get pounded with emails with their for. So you're gonna let it run, and if it dies, it dies. So you just let it go, and so usually it runs about a day. Um, and it usually won't kill it until we have pulled all of the messages back. So that can take a couple hours too. So when you're done, you kill it with fire. Collect your spoils, do what you will with your data. Um, Julie prefers color for charts, so um, I've gone full manager. Full manager, pie <laughs> charts, donut charts. She loves all of those. Um, and the uh, last thing is profit. Um, if you're low on money, it's a good way to get more money. Because all you have to do is just change people's direct deposits. <laughs> you don't do that, but we have actually leveraged some of the statistics Shane's gathered to improve our email hygiene significantly. So I'll pass it back to Julie. Cool. Thanks. All right, we did what? Um, when you do these, you're going to build these out, and you're going to you're going to lovingly craft this phishing campaign. You're going to tell everybody you think needs to know, and then you're going to have whoever your Shane is click that button and send those emails. And then stuff's going to happen. You need to be prepared, just mentally prepared for the fact that every time you do one of these, there are going to be unexpected consequences, um, like this. <laughs> so. So when we when we did that parking fish, like I say, we <laughs> yeah, way to go, Shane. Jerks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. They uh, they apologized for that though. They, they didn't did. know it was, they, it was me. they they made, they made nice with, with our with the KUIT Twitter handle. And you know, I'm really glad that this one happened when it did because the LPE has kind of blown up on Twitter lately, and they're kind of. They just surpassed 100,000 followers. I'm really glad they didn't have 100,000 followers when this happened. So, so, but, but this was the this was the the prime example of unexpected unexpected consequences. We did not think that people would take a day off work to drive to the Douglas County Courthouse about a parking ticket, or call the police, 
or show up at the Kane Public Safety Office. We just, we, we had no idea. We know a lot better now, but even then, we're still going, there's still gonna be unexpected consequences. One of our more recent phishing campaigns was just a run of the mill, you're, you are about to exceed your mailbox quota, click here to get more mailbox. So we had about 60 people who were like, well, I'm not gonna click that, but I will call a help desk and request a bigger mailbox. Just, we, we didn't expect them to like, follow instructions, but then they did, so what the hell? Um, when, you are, when you are collecting the statistics from your phishing campaigns, you should not keep them to yourself. Give your management reports. Give your, your administration or your C-level folks or your folks in charge of security spend <coughs> reports. The, the statistics around off-campus versus on-campus clicks were directly responsible for us finally adding features to our mail hygiene that do URL rewrite and allow us to track click-throughs even when users are off-campus. I consider that a huge win for this, especially since we spent about $5 on it. So get those reports, package them in those statistics, and package them in ways that are meaningful for non-technical people. Your report needs to have a concise executive summary and good storytelling because let's face it, as much as we would like all of the people who read our reports to read the entire thing and appreciate our well-crafted prose and our competently executed graphics, a lot of those folks are gonna read that executive summary and then they're gonna glaze over because this is nerd stuff and I don't understand it. So, so you need to make sure you're writing for people who don't necessarily do what you do or fully understand what you do. Um, and after three or four exercises, you should start working to identify trends. Do you have job types or locations or departments where you have a particular uptick in people who are willing to click through? Work with those departments or work with those supervisors to identify why is this subset of folks having trouble with this? Um, do you need to do targeted training? Do you need to reimagine how you're doing your annual required training? Do you need to do more phishing exercises with this, these people? And finally, one thing I would say is to get, get your thick skin ready. I mean, I, I think all of us that work in information security have, have sort of developed that over the years, but I felt like I had to step it up and never level with this, because inevitably, every time we run these, one or two people call me up and read me the riot act about how I'm gonna get them fired, and I'm the meanest person in the universe, and Yada, 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 yada. And I, I understand that this can freak people out, and I, I really do empathize with that. But one or two people out of 14,000, I mean, I, I'm going to weigh that feedback accordingly. And based on the benefit that this has shown, I'm not going to let a couple of angry people stop me. <clears throat> so, what's next? Um, for us, one of the things we're going to stop doing is notifying supervisors. Um, I got the bright idea, and I will own this, this was my crappy idea, uh, to notify supervisors when people actually click through and submit credentials. This didn't get us anything, and it actually, I think, in some ways hurt us. People don't want to work for us, work with us when we're, when we're tattling on them. So this needs to be a positive, positive thing. Um, we want people to feel good about reporting things to us rather than if I interact with the security office, they're going to sell me out to my supervisor. So we're not going to do that anymore. Um, GoFish is fantastic. GoFish got us over a hump when we didn't have any money to spend on this kind of thing. But my next goal is to move to a commercial tool. Um, it, 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 is, it is rather, GoFish is at this point at least rather labor intensive for us. And I feel like it's got enough moving parts that it's easy to screw it up. So I would rather just move on to a tool that lets us craft the message, mash the button, and collect profit at the end, right? I, I don't, I don't want to have to worry that I'm going to blow up our mail system or, or send a bunch of people down the wrong rabbit hole with a, with a broken tool. Um, and finally, uh, a goal of mine, once I can identify a budget for it, lol, is to start rewarding our users. Um, I want to be, you know, giving people praise for being the first to report a message, either overall or from the department. <laughs> Prizes. I'm going to start winging unlocked. candy at them. I was going to have Brittany come down with a candy gun. Boom! Um, and uh, re reward users on being the first to report, 
being the department with the lowest percentage of click-throughs, et cetera, et cetera. It's all that, you know, emphasizing the positive and showing everybody, hey, good stuff happens when you don't click these messages and when you work with the security office um, on, on, on reporting these things. So uh, finally, I wanted to share some helpful links. Uh, this is, these are the things that we worked from and were built as we, as we put this process together. Uh, GoFish is the open source phishing framework. It's fantastic. Go check it out. Um, I'm going to make these slides available so you don't have to take pictures if you don't want to. Um, and, and it sounds like they've done some development on it even since we started using it. So definitely go check that out. Uh, Shane's GitHub, all the cool kids have one. As we know, Shane's a cool kid, so <laughs> yeah, don't. It's two of his former colleagues are like, don't click Shane's GitHub. Um, you can click it, it's fine. Um, Brad Judy is, is my peer at the University of Colorado and wrote a really great white paper on, uh, on building a, a phishing program for your users. Even if you are not in academia or in the EDU space or anywhere near it, I would still suggest you read this because it's, it's really excellent. Um, a couple of things on the Nigerian scammer emails. The first one is a fairly accessible uh, just news article about it. The second one is the actual study that the guy at Microsoft did. It's a little bit more impenetrable, but still worth a read. And then uh, finally, measuring security awareness program results from SANS. It, it wouldn't be an InfoSec presentation if it didn't have a SANS link in it somewhere. So there it is. And that's all we've got. Um, that's our contact information. Um, please do feel out to reach out to me or Shane on email or Twitter. Um, we're always accessible. Technical questions about setting up GoFish should definitely go to him, but if you have other questions about the, the managerial side of it, please get in touch with me. Um, and we really appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, there's, the, there's the feedback slide. Thank you. Round of applause. Any questions? We've got about uh, just shy of 15 minutes or so for questions. I heard you both mention something about at the end pulling the emails out. Yeah. Are you having like the exchange administrators delete those and why? So um, we do have the exchange administrators delete those. We actually have we within the last probably three months they've built some PowerShell scripts that allow us to do that in an automated way. Um, so we just submit the, the sender address and it goes in and pulls them all out. Um, we do that because of the unintended consequences issue. Uh, after the help desk got their 50th or so request for a quota increase, they said, is there any way you could pull these messages because we're still getting these calls? And I said, yeah, we can do that. We also realized that when we get a real fish, we pull those. So why would we treat these any differently? Um, so we just started at the end of that day, we kick off a process, it pulls all the messages out of the inbox, and then we move on with our lives. Yeah. So could you drill in a little on the personal consequences dimension? Did you have to do any uh, intentional management of people's perceptions that you were out to get them? And did you have any supervisors? You took the supervisor thing a little bit. Did, did yeah. anybody say, I demand a list of all the people in my department who have done nothing like this? Yeah, so we did. When, when we send out that heads up email before we do a phishing, everybody that's going to receive the phishing message gets a heads up email that says, we're going to send a phishing email, here's how to spot it, here's how to report it, here are the rules of engagement. And the rules of engagement at first said, we won't tell anybody if you clicked. Um, then when we got the boneheaded idea to actually start reporting to supervisors, we said, if you click through and submit credentials, we're going to tell your supervisor. And that's when the angry phone calls really started coming in. So we just decided it wasn't worth it and, and backed it out. Uh, how did you handle like repeat offenders? I imagine you guys saw the same people continuously. Did you yeah. at that point engage supervisors or do anything to escalate the training? We, we don't, and that's, that's an area where we're still trying to decide what's the best way to handle it. Because honestly, the repeat offenders are a lot of times at or above my level on the org chart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so again, in the interest of continued employment, we tread carefully there. Um, it, it's, it's definitely an issue that I'm interested in pursuing, but, but it's not something we've figured out the best way to handle yet. 
that was actually related to what I was going to ask too. Uh, we at MU we struggle with the exact same thing because on the one hand, like Julie said, you don't want to make it punitive. You know, there there shouldn't be people shouldn't be fearing you know getting these emails and things of that nature. But at the same time, if you know Joe in accounting has failed all three of their OU's you know fishing tests, well, obviously some sort of training needs to take place. There needs to that you got to balance that knowing what your employees are doing and, and we have to work, I don't know what Kansas's work laws are, but in Missouri we're a right to work state. So that's, the, especially in higher ed when everything is so segmented, I know I have to worry about is the information I'm about to give to this manager possibly going to enable them to fire an employer because in that, I don't want that to happen. Yeah. Kansas, Kansas is right to work also. I mean, we, have a, okay. we have a very small number of represented employees, but for the most part, uh, we're right to work. And I am, I serve at the pleasure of my administrator, so I even have less ability to argue about getting fired than most people do. So yeah, we, we, we just decided that telling supervisors wasn't worth it. I'm coming. Um, thank you. I think his question actually brings up a better question my original one is there any or have you given any, given any consideration along with um, talking to HR about how the fishing tests shouldn't be considered in any way any form of thing, any form of action worthy of like disciplinary action or black mark on a record or anything like that you know have you communicated with HR in terms of defining anything like that? Because I'm wondering if some places in some way could, would, could or would want to use the results of that test as that and you when, want to. When we started doing supervisor notifications, we stressed that this is not something you need to take action on. This is not something that's meant to get the employee in trouble. We just want you to follow up with them and make sure they've taken their annual training. But then we, we, we fell victim to assuming that all supervisors are reasonable people. And, and wah, you know, wah. Wah, wah. We know that's not true. So, so we decided that it, just, it wasn't worth the risk and it wasn't worth the bad feelings. Okay. We got two, three. Three got a bunch. So I have a question on the other side. Mm -hmm. We fish all our new users about 30 days after uh, they're hired because they've completed their training then. Mm -hmm. And the reporting of the phishing is, is uh, disappointingly low. We get about 6% click through to credentials and we get about 3% reported as a fish. Mm -hmm. So we want to improve our, our annual training. Did you use your results here to make any changes or improvements to the training you were providing people? A, a little, but not much. Um, We've, we've got, we rolled out the annual training prior to starting the fishing exercises and we haven't really made any updates based on that yet, but that's, that's, in, that's in planning. And the training's gonna emphasize social engineering a lot more than it, than it does right now, because that, that's the big deal, right? Um, but we, I still find that the annual, or the quarterly, here's how to spot a fish message is is what drives people reporting things to us the strongest. Um, I don't have the numbers on it, but our our uh, our reporting rate of people that report fishes to us is way like way above. The average I think is like three percent for higher ed, and ours is somewhere in the fifteen percent range of people who report the messages to us. Plus, we get a lot more of just the standard phishing and spam type messages reported to us, and. You know, yes, this has also increased the number of messages that we get that we're like, who cares? Like, yes, someone spammed you for fake Viagra, who cares? But we feel like dealing with the cruft is worth the amount of good intelligence that we get out of that. So in one of your slides, you had a metric that showed most common noise windows, but the most common browser is Safari. Yeah. I'm not even to relate that in my head and how those two work together. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. And secondly, I was kind of wondering when you start showing the statistics for all of that, do you normalize based on 90% of my users are Windows and 
only so, so many percent of that clip through was a blah blah blah. So we normalize the thing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, uh, so the, the operating system versus the uh, the browser that was the iOS was also included separately. Um, so that's where that comes from. So Apple and iOS kind of had a lot. Okay. Um, so that's why Windows was the most used operating system. The Safari was the most used browser. Um, as far as normalizing data, I uh, I took the numbers of uh, people in departments because we uh, we normalized the data by by department and title. Um, the other data was not normalized, so it was by, I think, clicks. So I normalized the click data by department and by title, um, because, of course, there's disparities between people. You know, there, there are times where there's one person with a title because they're special. Uh, and there are other times where there's one person in a department because IT messed it up, or HR messed it up. So that, that was hard to, uh, it's hard to normalize, too, because, you know, one and one is 100%. How do you normalize that? But I did my best, and I tried to move people into groups that uh, seem similar, right? So if one of our uh, system administrators decided they don't want to be in the Department of Information Technology, but of IT, I moved them back. Um, I was also able to tap into HR's actual database where, you know, the IT people can't touch it, and I pulled that information. But even then, people have their own departments for some reason. I don't know, money. It's all about buckets. So normalizing the data it helps. Um, helps us see where the trends lie, right? So we see the high spikes in some department, and then you can see it kind of level off as the numbers go down. But also keep the the other side of the other, other side of the, the table there. How many people are clicking too? Because you want those numbers as well. Because that's what's most important. And then it's best to know where they are too. So. So yeah, we had we had the unnormalized and the normalized, and I included the normalized in the uh, the spreadsheets that we we handed up because it's easier to read, uh, and it, it made more sense for our purposes because we just wanted to pick out the, the bad people. I guess we're not going to avoid that on this your lovely face in our video, it's fine. You mentioned at the beginning about uh, being a college of people with English as a second language. Mm -hmm. Have you guys actually investigated that to see what the difference is uh, with the efficient campaigns as to how many, uh, what percentage of that is people with English as a second language? We, we haven't, and it is something I very much want to do and just haven't had the, had the cycles to do. But it is, it is absolutely on my list of things that I would, I would like to investigate. Because, I, because back of the napkin math tells me that based on the number of GTAs and GRAs we have and that they are one of our top categories of victims every time, and the number of those people who do speak English as a second language, I, I cannot help but think that there is a translation issue there. Uh, I was just curious, in the, the time period after you send out the, the warning email saying that you're, you're going to be doing one of these campaigns, do you notice a change in how people treat real phishing messages? Enormous, yes. And they're like, because we'll send one out, we'll be like, we'll send it out on Monday, we'll say we're going to fish you guys later on this week. And then every day up until we actually send it, was this one you guys? Was this one you guys? I bet this one was you guys. And, and it, so not only do we get accused of um, every phishing message they get being from us, we see a huge upswing in overall phishing messages reported because they're just dying to know if they caught us or not. So even though we don't award prizes, people get like personal satisfaction out of going, I caught you, it's so. So yeah. We got one minute, so. Yeah, any other questions? All right, I think we'll wrap it up there. Another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.